Ruby. Um, you moved to England when you were two with your mum and dad, and then you became the youngest Asian female chief executive of a FTSE 250 mm. company, which is an incredible achievement, something I'm sure they must be, and you must be, and family must be very proud of. But it's quite a journey, isn't it? Tell me, what gave you the drive to go and do that? Were you always interested in business? I think that when my earliest memories of coming to the UK was, it was really tough. Mum and dad came here with nothing. We grew up near White City. Um, I was there until I was eight, till they managed to save up more money to be able to move to North London. Um, they, they, they really struggled in those early years. And I think what that left me with was this huge sense of really wanting to, to not be in that situation. Um, and and they, they then ended up doing very well for themselves, but through huge amounts of hard work. And I found as I got older, I had to go find the thing that interested me. And I was really driven to achieve some success because I didn't want to be in the position they'd been in. And I found, I guess by accident, like many people do, a route into business, you know, after I did my degree, I qualified as an accountant. I wasn't too sure what to do next. I found myself going to work for a very, quite small organisation at the time that grew massively. And I found a real passion for growing businesses. But it was very much down to that early drive. And that's always stayed with me. I think that the opportunities they gave me by coming to the UK have been extraordinary. It's an amazing place for me to have grown up. It's been really tough at times, but equally so, it's been really incredible. I mean, it's even more incredible when you say it like that. I mean, I think it's incredible these days for any woman to be in charge of, you know, anything in the FTSE. Um, although those numbers are rising, they're rising incredibly slowly. Um, tell me how that happened. You obviously got into business. You started to realise you were the best at it. You became the chief executive. I mean, it's not quite as easy as that, though, is it? I think it was all down to opportunity. If you choose what I did, which was I chose a very young sector, very unknown, and I think, you know, that's where you do get opportunity. If I'd gone to, let's say, a huge bank, I'd have been in a in a hierarchy, in a system that would have been really difficult to grow out of. Instead, I joined a really young industry, which was growing and was really exciting, not just here, but globally. And suddenly it gave you an opportunity to be able to do more, to prove yourself at a very young age. And I found myself doing really, really huge contracts in my late 20s, early 30s, which you just wouldn't see today. I think as well then, the other big thing about the industry I'm in and outsourcing was they didn't really look at race or look at gender. They just needed talent to really help them grow yeah. because there weren't enough people. So you weren't really judged on anything else except for what you could do. And that, I think, is quite rare in business. Not I would say incredibly rare, particularly with the women yeah. that I've been meeting in these podcasts and talking yes. to. We've all, at some point, been put down because we're women, been put down because we're young women um, and found it you know, relatively difficult being the only woman in the room. I think it all comes down to who you work with. Certainly for me... The, my original CEO at Serco and then at Mighty were incredibly supportive and didn't ever ever do anything except tell me what I was good at doing and didn't do that. However, when I became the FTSE Chief Executive, and especially because I was the first Asian female to do it, and there's not been one since, that did attract some really interesting coverage because that was when I began to see just how biased the workplace could really be. But I saw that more from external coverage than within my own business. And I then began to meet a lot of people who'd obviously face way more barriers than I had. And so much of that was because of the environment they were in. And I think the workplace today is still really, really biased. It's biased against women. It's biased on race. If you don't fit, if you've not got the right background, if you've not got the right level of privileges. I mean, I was asked at my interviews, uh, for my tea if um, I did any hunting, shooting or fishing. And which you could, <laughs> what did you say? No, I'm not cave Well, I don't... I didn't really understand what, why someone like me would ever do anything like that, but I know the answer was well, categorically obviously not. Um, I wonder and, why on earth they wanted to I know was, that. In case I, you wanted to go shooting for the weekend. And I it? always was... And I was asked about whether I'd have more kids and all of this kind of thing, which... I kind of just sort of just shrugged, shrugged away. I don't think I reflected on it too deeply. I found it more difficult when I was actually in the limelight because that's when I felt I was judged more around my gender and my race. Are you talking about judged by the media? 
judged by everybody. Everybody you meet suddenly goes, and you know, people still say about me today, oh my God, you did really, really well, as if they don't expect it. Yes. Whereas I say, why would you say that? Why yes. would you say, oh wow, you did really well, yes. because you're Asian and female. Yes. Why don't you just say, well, you did really well, well yeah. done. And yeah. I think that's where we've got to get to, yeah. because we still automatically, men and women, judge each other on what they perceive to be the norm and I don't fit the norm therefore there must be a reason why I did it differently or why I got there not really I just think I was in an industry that was growing that I really loved and I loved what I did and I did it well and when you say you felt this pressure that um, you know the very first thing that was talked about was that you were a female and Asian mm. as opposed to your ability which must mm. have been quite a difference for you that was probably always the headline was it yes always. Um, how did you cope with that I found that really difficult I found it really difficult talking to people about it I've only ever spoken around women about women in the last five six years I never did before I've only just started talking about race now I found it incredibly uncomfortable because nobody had discussed it with me before and nobody ever talked about it. So I, I'd always ignored those issues. And suddenly it was at the forefront of every conversation was, how did you do it because you're a woman? How did you do it because of your background? Yeah. How did you do it because you came from nothing? How did you do it because you didn't grow up with any great networks or contacts? And I kept thinking that that made me uncomfortable. Is it because the answer is because you're good? Well, it is. And people are thinking that there's got to be something well, more to it than actually just ability. Well, that's a, that's absolutely it. But I think because, you know, people do judge you still today on gender, looks, on where, where you've grown up, what you've done. And I think that's massively unfair to so many people, which is one of the reasons I got heavily involved in really promoting diversity in the workplace, because I think it's massively important not to be judged on any of that. And let's go back to talent alone. But it's quite hard to do that with this unconscious bias. I did this mm. television programme that looked into why women earn less than men. And there is this unconscious bias. When they look at a woman, they think, oh, God, you're going to run off and have a baby. Oh, you know, it's very emotional. They have all of these things that are, that are subconsciously planted into the mind of the HR directors who are pointing. How do we get over that? Because the gender pay gap is still... 14%, so for every pound a man make, a woman makes 86p. But in some industries, like finance, for example, it's 40%. Mm. You're working hard to, 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 to campaign for diversity. What can businesses do? You run one of the biggest businesses in this country. What, what can be done? At the end of the day, what matters the management teams? We've done a really good job in the UK of saying we want more women on boards. But most of those roles are non-executive roles. There is very, very, very few women that run large companies in the UK. And there needs to be a huge more that don't just run them as chief executives, um, as managing directors, as VPs, but actually also as chairs as well. And then I think you'll see a, a big change. I certainly found when I became a chief executive, I got maternity leave. I got <coughs> needing a sabbatical, which you need time out. I got, it really doesn't matter if you flex because you've got to go pick up your child. I really wasn't interested in any of that because to me that was normal. I was having to do all of those yeah. things. And it's not till boards really have that own personal experience that they can really change a culture. And that's when you'll lose the gender pay gap because you'll lose it over time. But we need more women to run things. And that's what we've got to promote. It's the executive pipeline that really matters. Um, and we've got to look into the reasons what, as to what's stopping women really doing that and we've got to put the support around them and sponsor them into those roles now I think we've waited too long we're really really good at saying how women are doing better but actually on pay they're not yeah and that's not going to change and still until they're in charge of running things and that really needs to happen soon I 100% I mm. agree with you I think it's really interesting as well that uh, you won't even attract the women through the door if you don't have a positive mm. culture um, mm. you know and you don't have uh, flexibility mm. and you don't have understanding mm. um, and you're missing out you the company are missing mm. out on all this talent if you don't recognize that I think that companies are beginning to change but also I think it dry I get really really frustrated when I hear stats like only 19% of women will negotiate a pay rise for themselves compared to like 90% of men who were forever asking for more, more, more. There seems to be that sort of 
Is it lack of confidence in a woman to get what they're worth, to get their pay? And what I advice think, would you give? I think it is around potential confidence challenges, lack of self-esteem, am I good enough? Women always, always, always look at what they can't do. They never focus on their strengths, they focus on how they develop themselves to be better. And I think that's a real challenge for them. So I, my advice on all of this is make sure you've got a great sponsor work for someone who's going to support your career and who's going to pay you properly and who really respects what you have and if they don't then go work for somebody who actually does because sooner or later i think that's the bit that's got to change for women they've got to know that the organizations they're working for will absolutely treat them equally and we all talk around being equal opportunity you know, we talk about equal opportunity we talk around being of course we believe in equality but we can't believe in equality when so few women run businesses or mm. at the top of any executive role and until that changes i don't think we've got equality in the workplace at all i think it's right and i think also women who are working in an organization yes they have role models people like you people like martha people like joe all mm. the women we've met through these podcasts but what they actually need is a real woman working on the board who has a family who's managing it Absolutely. all who is their inspiration who's yes. creating that change and championing their cause and we also need the male CEOs we have in the UK to champion their cause too. And while we've got a shortage of women at the top, is sponsor them into those roles. Yep. And say, no, I will work with you, one, two, or three of you, to really, really, really make sure you shine in our organisation in the next three years. Because mentoring is one thing. You know, you can mentor many women, but if you can't actually help them with their career yep. and give them the next job, then, and all they're doing is fighting against cultures that don't recognise them, yep. then all the mentoring in the world isn't really going to help. Because, you, you know, you're telling someone they're really fantastic and they're working for an organisation that refuses to recognise it. Yep. And my view is women should do what a lot of the guys I know do, move around more and actually be brave enough to move. And that is just as tough as negotiating a pay rise. It's actually, they want to stay, they feel committed, but actually, you know, the better opportunity could be somewhere else because someone's prepared to recognise your talent in the right way, not the way it's currently being recognised. And did you do that? I moved. Yeah, I've moved. I moved. I remember when I moved from Serco, it was fantastic, I had young children. It was a global role. I was never going to get the flexibility I wanted. So I took some time off and I drew my tea and I joined them because the chief executive and chairman said, we will support you and we will teach you what you don't know about running a public company. Because when a woman, or actually when anyone does it for the first time, they don't know yeah. how to do it all. And you need people to help you do it and really help you and train you in some of what you just don't know with the city, for example. So I think that really matters and we don't have enough sponsors out there for women at all. I think that's a really important lesson, isn't it? That fear comes from the fact that you think you should know it all and you don't. Mm. But actually not knowing it all is a good thing because Absolutely. when you think you know it all, and that's the point where you really know nothing. Mm. Uh, lifelong learning is important, isn't it? And Absolutely. it's and not being afraid to ask for help when you need it. Mm. Um, because great leadership is not really about how much you know how to do, but how you behave when you don't know what to do. Mm. And that fear of asking for help can be catastrophic, I would imagine, in a, in a huge PLC. It's, it's really tough. And, and also, those roles at the top are really, really lonely roles. You don't have many people to speak to, and you don't have many people necessarily understand, especially when there's only a few women doing them, who really genuinely understand the challenges of doing that, that role, bring up a family, being a mother, being you know, a parent, being a wife, be, being yeah. everything, man, supporting your parents, yeah. um, making sure your teams are okay. I mean, it is a, a the, they are huge but very lonely roles because everyone's looking to you to always smile, to always be perfect, to always be their inspiration. And there are days when, quite frankly, you can't be that friendly. <laughs> <really. And, laughs> Least of all yourself. And, and that's the that's the challenge because actually I think a lot of women. Uh, really do wear their heart on their sleeves, they want to do a really good job. We all know that leadership's around really driving a vision and driving a way forward, even in tougher times as well as really good times. And not everyone's got that about them. So the more support you can get, the better, always, I say. And when you were, you found yourself the chief exec of this huge company, um, 
obviously more challenges must have come your way and I'm not talking about gender challenges or pay mm. challenges because I'm pretty sure no one would walk over you in in, mm. in relation to that but more challenges about um, creating this workforce allowing other women to come mm. through looking after a family that juggling act that you obviously had to do I think our kids are very similar ages mm. um what, how did you cope with that and, and what lessons did you learn about that? I found that really, really difficult. My husband and I both, for the first three years of that role I did, were very much trying to get me, before I became a chief executive and I was CFO, we were both juggling huge roles. And so we came to a decision that said, look, if I do this, one of us, I either do this or I stop because we're both doing big roles. And he decided he wanted to stop doing what he was doing so he could firstly support me but secondly there are other things he wants to do which weren't going to be as pressurised which meant he could be around more if that hadn't happened I wouldn't have had had I guess the sanity to do it all because I needed him around more um, because you are very much at the beck and call of the group you work for yeah. uh, as well as your children um, and family you know holidays uh, mum and dad helped out a lot my sisters helped out um, it was a bit of a family kind of kind of support network I had to have and close friends as well because that was the only way I could do it. Now everyone's different, but for me that network around me ha- was incredibly important. So that I, although I felt under a lot of pressure all the time, I felt I could do it. But even though you had that network and people were helping you, so you were clear mm. that your kids would be fed and mm. they would be picked up mm. from school and someone would help them mm. with their homework, all the things mm. you can't go to work unless you know absolutely mm. you're looked after. It doesn't help you with the guilt, does it? And I know mm. lots of women who either are thinking about have a family and think, oh my God, how do I cope? Or have a young family, want to get back into work, and are then thinking, am I perhaps the world's worst mother because I'm at work and my child is at home? I think guilt's with us all. I think you just have to accept that if you're going to do both, you're going to get guilt. You're going to get a range of emotions you're not going to like. Um, but what you are going to get overall is you've got to think about about children, I guess, they're going to grow up. And the question comes is, what do you want to do when they grow up? My big worry when my kids were smaller was, it's great, I love being around them all the time, but they're going to grow up, they're going to need me less, and I did need something else in my world, bar the children. Not everybody does, but I did. But I think that you've got to be really, really clear about the fact that you're going to face a range of emotions which are really uncomfortable. Um, I pretty much felt guilty about most of it. Yeah, and, and, and actually, sometimes work's more important than home, and sometimes mm. home is more important than work, and you just sort of spend your whole life going Absolutely. like this. But I think one of the things we should both let other women know is my kids are 22 and 20. How old are you? Same age? Same age. Yeah. Same age. Yeah. Yeah. Mine are fine. Are yours fine? Mine are absolutely exactly. fine. Exactly. So yeah. I think you should know that it's not the nanny or your mother or your sister mm. or your friend who picks them up that makes sure um, their homework is done mm. or they've had something to eat. It's the different lessons you can teach them being a absolutely. working parent, isn't it? Both of mine would always say they were really pleased I worked as well, that they, they actually felt that that was a better balance for me as well. And we have a great relationship, really, really close relationship. We're a great family unit. Um, we just chose to do it slightly differently to many others. Yes, but I think that should inspire other people, that mm. even if you're sitting there at the moment listening to this and you've got a baby or a toddler or a young, you know, a young child and you're thinking, God, I've got to go to work tomorrow, am I the world's worst? No, no you're absolutely not. not. No. Um, I also think we've got to be quite brave as well. I remember when my little boy was really tiny, he was really, really unwell not long after he was born, and it meant for the first couple of years he he would get ill at certain times um, and you, you've got to be really brave about it I would just call up so I'm not coming in yeah you know I'm sorry this is just too important yeah I could have lost him when he was a baby yeah and that meant that he came first um, and there's nothing wrong in saying that and also accepting that careers are around a total juggling act you really genuinely don't know how it's all going to go and you just have to accept it for what it is I probably found that the hardest the big thing for me that was really difficult was the lack of control I felt over over being able to juggle all of that. Some of that was just outside my control. Accepting that was the toughest thing. Yeah, I don't. I don't disagree. Mm. I don't disagree. But I think you can. You have to accept. You can only do what you can do. And um, like you, the two most important things in my life were 
my work, my kids, mm-hmm. and my work. I didn't want to give up either. No, uh, and they've survived. They're yes. perfectly normal, happy, mm-hmm. healthy. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. you know, p- young people with a bit of drive, and no. and certainly their own, own opinions. Um, you were made a life peer in two thousand and fifteen. Um, tell me a little bit about your life here. Are you spending a lot of time here? I'm probably here in, in the House of Lords once a week, maybe twice a week. I'm really in on, on again, talking around the issues I'm passionate around, so if it's around diversity in the workplace. I spoke in the budget yesterday, I'm speaking in a big debate on plastics on Thursday. If it's a particular interest of mine, I'll come in and talk about it. Um, I'm on one of the EU committees too, um, which is interesting in its own right. Um, but, but no, that you know, I would limit it to that. I still love business as well, but it's fantastic to be able to do both. But I guess what you're doing is you're making a difference to policy, yes, which is which equally should, important. Yeah. Yeah. And you can use all your experience and all your mm. knowledge and all the things you're passionate about to drive through change. And this is the right yeah. place to do it, isn't and absolutely. it? Absolutely. And I found this when I chaired the Women's Business Council for the government. You know, my big point for them was very much around 30 hours of free childcare and it was something I was really really wanted to make sure we could do almost from day one it's taken time to come in but I think that um, more support around parental leave um, more support in schools for girls with careers you can begin to shape policy which is why it's so satisfying to be able to do a little bit of public service too. I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased that you're here um, I'm not making that much of a contribution, I have to sadly admit, with all my other commitments, but I am focused on coming in to vote and doing everything mm. that I can, but it is a, it is a real privilege to be Huge here, privilege. isn't it? Yeah. Um, so what I was really thinking about was, um, and I've been talking to all the, all the other women about it really, is, is, is sort of core values of a person that drive you forward, that make you who you are, that lead you to make deci- certain decisions a certain way. Um, and I always say about myself that my core values at 18 when I left school, because I didn't go to university, I went straight to work. Mm-hmm. And the reason I did that is I'd been at boarding school. And when you're at boarding school, nothing is your own. You get up when you're told, you go to bed when you're told, you eat what you're told, you wear what you're told, frankly, you do what you're told. And I'd had enough at 18 of being, being do, you know, doing what I was told and I wanted to be in charge. And I realised actually that the route to independence was, uh, or the desire for independence was my absolute uh, ambition. Um, and I realised that independence, you had to have money, but I didn't know how you made any money. So at 18, I decided to get a job. And, um, and I had no qualifications other than O levels as they were in the, that days and A levels. But I did have these sort of core values, which were the things that made me who I, who, who I was. And I was ambition and I was driven uh, and I had integrity. And I think now at 49, they're still my core values. I just wanted to ask you, what do you think is the you know inside you that has driven you to have this hugely successful business life this wonderful career this position in the house of lords i know you're very close to government doing so many great things for me it's around i've always been really really driven in business i love growing businesses and i'm really driven to grow businesses that's what i love doing and I've, that hasn't changed from a very young age, I just love being part of the excitement you can create as you grow and you develop new propositions in business. But also on top of that, I've always had from a very, very early age, a real passion to want this to be, you know, the country I grew up in, to be an even more amazing country year on year. It's a country I'm massively proud of, and therefore I want to make a real positive impact on policy where I can, and really help with my experiences. And that matters as much to me as my business career because I genuinely do love the UK and want it to be this flagship for the world and everything extraordinary. And I think we can be so leading on diversity, on the environment, on everything we do economically, and any part I can play in that I will. So for me, it's really around, the drive comes from wanting to make a massive difference in the areas I know about, um, and I'm massively passionate about the areas I believe in, and I, you know, it's what it what's it's really is what gets me up in the morning. It really excites me. And I guess just finally, um, we'll have young women who are listening to this, and they may be just starting out in their career. They may be leaving university and wondering what career to go into. They may be in a job. They may be coming back from maternity leave. They may be thinking about a second career because their kids have gone and they've got some time on their hands. 
if they work in big business, which is what I consider you've been in, mm. these huge, you know, mm. massive companies with how many employees did you 65, have? 65,000. 65,000. I mean, that's mm. it, a massive, massive business. What advice would you give them? How do you rise to the top of a company that has 65,000 employees if you want to? You start small. So what you do is you go and you grow something and you put, you create your positive impact on it. You grow and you nurture a business. And if I was doing it today, I, you go to technology and AI businesses. You go to the unknown, you go to what I did. When I left um, BGO where I was training as an accountant, when I, when I qualified, all my friends were going to the big brands and everyone was going to all the names you knew in the 90s. And they kept saying to me, where are you going to work? And I kept saying to a company called Serco, and they kept saying, what does that <laughs> company do? And it takes about half an hour to explain what outsourcers do. And they said, why are you going there? And I said, well, because I really like the management team and I think they're really interesting people and I can learn a lot from them. And that's my big thing. Go to the young companies, go to people you can learn from, go and work with management teams that are massively, massively driven and who excite you because it was that management team at Serco that gave me my passion for business because so I could see what they could create and I really wanted to be part of what they were creating and then to do it on my own one day. And I learned from them. And, and particularly when you're first starting out, you'll know as well as I do, Karen, you're learning every day. You learn all the way through your career, but you're really learning in those early yep. years. And, you le- and I think I learned more in that nine years I spent at Serco than I have in my whole career because ultimately, we were doing things for the first time that had never been done. And that's the same with most technology companies today. That's the same with most AI companies. Go and do things that actually have got a massively exciting future. But that involves taking some risk, doing the unknown, not going with the usual trends of what everybody else wants to do, and kind of being able to define yourself a bit. And for me, it was because I really love the people and I realised that what I wanted to do was work in people businesses and I really love working with people businesses, I love working with people, I I think that's really great fun, um, much more into that than maybe other businesses out there um, and I think that's what we, young women should do and I think they should be braver in the choices they make. It's very easy, you become a grad, you go on a grad scheme you go and do something, well actually, why don't do what you did, or what I did, which is go and join an industry that no one knows very little about, go and do what you did, which was, good grief, you went into football. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I like something I would consider yeah. doing. But no one does that. But that's, I think, how you can really stand out and make a difference. And I think the other thing that I've taken is inspiration from your story is if someone gives you a chance take it oh totally like you were saying you know well they had few people so they probably gave you things you probably didn't know how to do but you found a way to to go to go and do them because at the end of the day it's true isn't it only you can champion your career only you can push yourself well no one no one else is going to know you as well as you do and also i think you've got to work with people that can really stretch you you don't want to be having an easy time i mean i look back at this in those early years and think my god how did I do it now um it was absolutely exhausting but good grief I learned a lot yeah Uh, and you learn from the tough experiences too and that's my other big piece of advice for young women don't just think it's going to be nice yes I had a big I've had a big career I had ups and downs in that decade running a FTSE company from things that went well that didn't I have learned a lot more from the things that were tougher than from the things that were easier and when it was tough when you're running a company with 65,000 jobs, which is such a huge responsibility, and it was tough, how did you get through those tough times? It was really difficult. You've got to have a really, really, really good team, and you've got to have a really good close-knit team that are going to keep you pretty sane every day, especially if you're shutting parts of businesses or you're downsizing in some areas. Those are really difficult things to do, and they need to be difficult things to do. You need to feel really bad yep. about some of those decisions and some of the things you have to do. Um, it isn't all about a better road to business. Every business, however successful it is, has its ups and its downs in aspects of it. And I think that it was learning to deal with some of those, and I certainly saw it in outsourcing a lot over the years. You you deal with those, but you've got to be with a really great team. And if you can build a great team around you, do you know what? I really think you can get through most things. Doing it on your own, it's not possible to do on your own. 
I guess, or being a member of a great team. Yes. Because yeah. I think mm. a lot of people forget, don't they, that businesses are only good, as good as the people that work okay. there. Mm. And if mm. you're really trying your best and you're helping push mm. the company forward and you're coming up with ideas and you're not afraid mm. to give your opinions, you're valuable. Well, well, absolutely. And I think the other big thing is being that team player, being part of a team. And, you know, in the businesses I've built, I'll know everyone I built this business with for life because yeah. we did way more than just run a business together. We were in each other's lives yeah. all the time. Um, because, and we've, we've grown in an industry together. So absolutely, you're going to go through a lot together. You're going to have great memories, great experiences, tougher experiences together. But you know each other really, really well. You know what's good about you. You know what's not so good about you. You know where you've got strengths, where others have got strengths. And that's a big thing for me about teams is always surround yourself with people with brilliant complementary strengths to you and those that can help address your weaknesses. Never, ever, ever be afraid of just saying, do you know, this isn't a great day. We're not getting this right. Yeah. Let's work out what to do. And... Um... You, you you know, having run one of these huge companies, a, a top 250 company, what next? I think for me, it's around, I've certainly found, I think the House of Lords probably opened my, my eyes a little bit more to what I could do. Um, I'm moving much more portfolio, much more advisory, but actually I will end up growing other businesses, but probably more in, in chair roles because, because I think when you kind of done the CEO role, I've done one huge one is fantastic. Another one I'm not ever too sure about. I don't know if it can ever be as good as what you did. You can never say never, but it's much more likely to be down a portfolio uh, of roles. But part of that will be also be supporting the government in, in for my huge passion for equality in the workplace. So I just don't think we've come as far as we would like to think we have. Well, I can't wish you enough luck on behalf of all the women who are listening and my own daughter uh, who is relying on people like you and I to help push through that change and make that change happen. You've had such a fascinating career. I can't imagine how difficult it is to manage 65,000 people. I think I've got 800 in one of my, in, in my business and that's that's hard enough. But it's been so lovely speaking to you. It's been so, so fabulous having you as a friend and, and knowing you and I can't wish you enough luck. Thank Should you go you down and have a cup of tea in the Absolutely. in the <laughs> in the That's Lord's Bar, best. or maybe Absolutely. something stronger? Yes. <laughs> Very Thank good. You.